Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux. I'm Vin, that's Jill, that's you, you're watching us live on Twitch, come do it, I dare you. 3 p.m. Eastern, twitch.tv forward slash Linux Gamecast. What's up? What's new? A couple of things I want to talk about right at the beginning of the show because I didn't realize how many people had no idea what was going on. Have you ever been to Reddit, Jill? I oh. am sorry, Vin. I accidentally muted myself. You accidentally, or was it on purpose? Did you accidentally? <laughs> it was not on purpose because I was sneezing before the show started. <laughs> well, actually, Jill, you accidentally forgot to unmute your show. Yes, I forgot to <laughs> unmute myself. <laughs> I was looking around and I was like, Jill's talking, wait, am I getting audio? I don't yeah. know, man. <laughs> yeah, so you've heard of this Reddit thing, you know, this new thing that's been out, just came out yesterday. And, um, mm -hmm. Mine. I have an old Reddit account, like 16-year-old Reddit account. I've been on Reddit forever. But we were talking about it in uh, Trackmania last night. I, I was trying to break down, explain what's going on. Because even if you don't use Reddit, one thing you know about Reddit is like when you're searching for stuff, especially for you know open source Linux-related stuff on whatever search engine you're using, you're going to end up on Reddit a lot. Yeah, our Linux is very popular. <laughs> Open source, Raspberry Pi yeah. projects, you know, things like that. And you might be wondering, you know, why does it look like this now? You know, let's just say you go to our Linux and it says, hey, this is now a private community. What's going on? It's in protest of the API changes, which has affected third-party app developers and also moderators, because Reddit has decided to double down on exorbitant charge to access their API to the point of the sole purpose of this is just to get rid of third-party apps. And the problem with that oh, is multifaceted, yeah. mainly because, like, not just like third-party apps. I use Relay on Android because their Android app is poo. We'll put it like that. But a lot of these third-party apps also offer accessibility features that are not available in the primary app, which is also important. And something you might not think about is moderation features. People who moderate these subs, a bunch of tools have been built oh, yeah. Yeah. that lean into the API to allow people to moderate larger subs effectively. So, um, you know, this initially started it as like a two day, I mean, we're just going to put everything private. Then the memo came out, I think yesterday or maybe day before yesterday that came out, like the CEO said, we're just going to wait them out. They're not going to affect anything. And that's the worst thing to say. Because uh, when somebody yeah. tells you, oh, you're not going to do that, what, what do you immediately do? Oh, yeah. So a lot of uh, subs mm -hmm. have decided to just stay like this until something has worked out. We're going to see. I hate to see um, all of this tech drama going on. Yeah. But yeah, that's why a lot of your subreddits that you might normally be visiting, just not there right now, which is unfortunate, but completely understandable yes yeah i just want to let everybody know a little heads up about what's going on there we haven't switched our linux or linux underscore gaming or open source and a bunch of other subreddits they're not private well hopefully they will come on private at some time once this all gets worked out right mm -hmm. yeah that'll be good now working on a couple of things this week in the pipe coming down to you I'm finally going to make this. I saw, um, we use Discord a lot. And we have our own Discord for, you know, Twitch subs and uh, patrons. The thing I see most common is screen share, desktop audio share doesn't work on Discord under Linux. I see it every week because on uh, TweetDeck, I just have a search saved that just says, you know, just like Linux audio. Mm. And people go just constantly. And I understand Maybe you don't know how to get it work. Just make it work. And I'm going to show you how to make that work with Jack. It's really simple. What inspired me to do this is somebody had created a bot that you could put in Discord and host on another server in order to get your desktop audio into Discord. And I'm like, if you're willing to do that, you're willing to install Jack. And it's real simple. I'm going to show you how to set up mm -hmm. Jack, show you how to set up a virtual sync, show you how to connect it. I've never had a problem with this. been using it since... And it's not just Discord. Anything you want to share audio from point A to point B, you can do it on your desktop. It's not going to cost you a thing. And it's real easy to do. Don't be scared of it. Maybe I'll get that knocked out next week. But I'm trying to decide that Debian 12 is out, right? Uh -huh. So 
I want to show people how to build an actual workstation for anything. Now, I'm going to be building an audio workstation, but an actual workstation. And where the planning for a workstation starts with the hardware that you have. I'm not going to say you go out and buy this particular hardware. No. Where it starts with the hardware you have, and especially for audio, it starts in your BIOS. That's where you start setting things mm-hmm. up. A lot of people don't know a lot of the stuff. I'm going to try to walk you through it and give you an actual appliance if you are looking to build one of those. You know, I, I have an entertaining intro planned out for it. Outside of that, not a whole lot going on. Um, Jill's built a PC, however. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I built this. In fact, it's sitting right next to me, and Ven's going to show it on the screen, too. I built a new mid-range gaming Linux rig from parts in my computer studio just so I could start using this awesome new computer case I bought, which is inspired by my favorite game, Portal! (laughs) Honestly, I literally waited for years for this case to be released. The company's name is Perifio, and uh, they use this case for pre-built machines, but... um, hadn't had the the case individually sold for a very very long time so i grabbed one from their website as soon as it came available but now it's also available on amazon see how pretty this case is isn't it cool it 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 totally is portal aesthetic (laughs) so the case is white and the front panel is rounded just like the computers in portal and it has a blue and orange led fans that glow in this slit in the front panel and in a, a clear side panel. <laughs> and yeah, obviously you can tell I love Portal so much that I have a large plus Portal companion cube directly behind me and several Portal signs and turrets that decorate my studio. <laughs> I've got them, these little turrets everywhere. <laughs> and so the, the specs of the system are, um, it has a Ryzen 5 4600G in it. 32 gigs of RAM, a terabyte NVMe, an NVIDIA GTX 1660 Super. And I'm thinking of getting an AMD RX 6800 XT for it, which would make it a much higher end gaming rig. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm loving the, the latest AMD cards, at least the ones from last generation, the RX 6950 XT I'm using right here in my podcasting rig. And I have an RX 6600 XTB in a rig behind me. So I think I'm going to keep this, my, my portal machine, all AMD as well. But for right now, it's got a, a pretty sweet NVIDIA GTX 1660 Super in it, which will be just fine for 1080p gaming. <laughs> oh, man, that's, that's, that's nice. You got a nice vintage video card in there, man. Yes, I, I do. I do. <laughs> right on, right on. That's neat. Uh, there'll be a link to um, the portal case from what is it ninety seven ninety nine? Yeah. Um, Perifio is that the yeah. name of the company? Correct, Perifio. Okay, right on. So <laughs> there it is. It's right. Go check out the video version. Jill's got it right next to her, and she's probably not going to knock it off the. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is right next to me, and I'm aware of that. <laughs> if if I do, the turrets will come after me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Debian 12's up. Bookworm, <laughs> as they call it in the legend. We got a storm coming in, by the way. So you might hear some boom, boom, boom. There's your fair warning, everybody. Mm-hmm. Bookworm's finally out. It's a special time of the year. We all rejoice because Debian doesn't come out very often, but when it does, it's always good. So it's yes. time to change your repos from Bullseye over to the Bookworm. Add that non-free firmware if you're using non-free, which if you're using Debian, chances are you probably have non-free enabled because modern PCs kind of need that to boot. And um, all you got to do is an apt update, apt upgrade. That's it. Welcome to Debian. Jordan was asking about that earlier this week. He's like, I've never done an in-place uh, Debian. That, that's it. You change your app repos. You do an update, do an upgrade, do a disk upgrade after that. Unless, I'm going to give you a free little pro tip. So sometimes when you do an in-place upgrade with Debian, you might run into held packages. Because it just can't figure out what's going on with this. And it's like, I don't know about this particular package. And this, this is a safety thing. 
All you have to do is do a reinstall on that particular package and it'll sort it for you. Nine times out of 13, that'll solve your problem. But what do we get in this latest version of Debian? You get kernel 6.1. Nice to see. GIMP 2.10. Okay. XFCE 4.18. Latest and greatest. So on and so on and so on. Now, something that's going to make you hipsters sad. The new minimum processor requirement is i686. I know. You're not going to be running Debian on your... Um, but look, look at it this way. You're not really running those computers anyway. So you can put a Deb Debian sticker on. You can still in, you know, put a hard drive in there with Debian on. You just can't do yeah. anything with it. Yeah, you can install, uh, install an older version of Debian with no problem. And Jill, you've, apparently <laughs> you, you've noticed that there's new desktop wallpaper. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the desktop wall wallpaper is designed by Juliet Taka. And it's called Emerald, and it's uh, really pretty. I was re really enjoying the uh, the desktop and the and the whole um, theming for uh, this version of Debian. And it also has new fonts, which are are um, uh, come along with a new FNT command line tool for accessing. 1500 DFSG compliant fonts, which is a couple really, of new really fonts. Cool. They change your default fonts. They yeah. change your default terminal <laughs> font just slightly enough to go, I know. that's different. <laughs> I know. I noticed that right off, <laughs> right off the hand when I was uh, playing around with it. And one of the major changes includes the deprecation of OS Prober by default in the Grub bootloader to check for existing OS installations. This, of course, mainly affects dual boot users who will need to rely on dpackage reconfigure now, or you can edit the file etsy default grub and ensure you have the setting grub disabled os prober equal false and rerun update grub like I will when I install Debian 12 on one of my systems with many distros installed on them. And because I have quite a few <laughs> computers with lots of distros on them. And I was a little sad when Debian took this out, but it's an easy fix. <laughs> and I guess apparently then they were having some issues. I mean, you're running Debian, Prover. you already know your way around this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's, it's like, hey, let, let, let me explain to Debian. It's like, I'm running Debian, I know. Yeah. <laughs> And um, I, one thing I played with uh, was was uh, the Debian 12 I played was, with was the live Cinnamon desktop ISO, um, which includes the Cinnamon desktop 5.6. And I installed the ISO on one of my iMacs, and it ran beautifully. I have several iMacs I use for distro testing. And I'm just going to keep Debian on there because I had Debian 11 on there, but I just did a wipe and and... A full uh, regular install instead of doing an update. I'm a huge proponent of in place uh, <laughs> Debian upgrades. Everything in the studio, actual production boxes. These aren't playing around boxes. These aren't boxes for fun, entertainment, enjoyment, or other things like that. They're yeah. all about business. Business work. Five machines have been upgraded. <laughs> Four machines. That's not true. One of them's still running Debian 10. Laziness mm, okay. is the reason behind that. <laughs> do not do a Debian 10 to a Debian 12 upgrade. It will, it will be a bad time. It will fight you the entire time, and it will probably end up in a non-bootable system. But if you're looking for a weekend project, go ahead and try it. So oh, absolutely. Uh, in place mm -hmm. upgrades for Debian, not a problem. Straightforward. Yeah. Nothing to do. You change your app repos. But again, you're running Debian. You already know this. I'm just telling you stuff here yeah, right now. Yeah, it's already stuff we've been doing before. Um, <laughs> no other problems with that. And um, So... Yeah, I, I've, I'm trying to, I'm sitting here, have, have I run into a hiccup? Because what I do is usually, because, you know, they don't pin down a hard date until really close to a Debian release, but you, you just start feeling it by like, where, where things at, what's yeah. getting pushed in. You're like, it's, it's getting about time as I'll change one of these boxes back here, because I have uh, three boxes under the desk for uh, three different co-hosts. And... I'll bring those in and I'll switch one of them over to testing, then another over to testing, and I'll start tracking testing once once I'm confident in that, and then I'll move the DAW over to testing, then I'll move the thread booper over to testing. And mm. when they're like, okay, we get a release date, then you can change your app to repos and it'll just you can go from testing and it'll just sync up. 
to 12 and it'll stay there, which is a really cool thing. Happy to see it. Yay. Everyone go out and install Debian. Yeah. There's a reason everything is based on Debian. (laughs) Yeah. Because Debian is such a good base. It is the foundational OS. (laughs) Very stable. It is. It's what you want. It's what you Mm -hmm. want. That is the. um, It's not even understand it. It's the flawed idea for taking. Again, this is like, what are we going to be using to do the workstation stuff? Debian. And a common question or a misinformed statement you'll see is like, okay, we're going to be setting up an audio production system. Or we're going to be setting up a video production system, be it with, uh, you know, whatever. Like, well, if you're going to be running that, you're not going to have the latest and greatest stuff coming out every other week. I'm like, yes, I'm not going to have moving targets under the production yeah, system that stuff could to potentially break, break things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once I get this installed and working, all it gets is security updates because you know next time I cut it on and I update things, it's still going to be working. Absolutely. Um, mm. Yeah. Go install Debian if you like Debian. If you don't like Debian, go install um, uh, Suzy. <laughs> yeah. We don't shout out Suzy enough. There you go. <laughs> then. Then I want you to set up the latest and greatest in desktop. Desktop? Yes, desktop. Desktop technology. (laughs) Technology. Desktop technology. (laughs) So, yes, there is an innovative new open source desktop manager in development called Kara Desktop. And this is unique. Kara Desktop is a web-based cross-platform desktop environment for Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and Chrome OS. And as Kara states, it is an easy, pleasant, speedy, and exciting way to use your favorite OS. And the default theme is actually, it uses a very bright rainbow of colors, which I'm sure, I'm sure Ven doesn't Does quite Disease RGB, get it away. Yes, it's, 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 it's definitely the RGB desktop versions of RGB LEDs. <laughs> <laughs> with all the, the pretty square icons. And it, it actually reminds me of a cross between my favorite X window manager, Window Maker, with its square icons and dock apps, to the menu systems of After, After Step, Unity, and Budgie desktops, kind of all combined into one. And on the left of the desktop, there is a drawer launcher, which is carefully organized to help you open an app, file, or web page. And um, the drawers on the right are a quick way to use apps within the drawer, almost like widgets for opening the weather app, calendar, notes, clip art, settings, et cetera, et cetera. And you can activate a favorites dock on the bottom of the screen by clicking favorites show at bottom button in the top of the left drawer. I, I did that immediately because I felt like I needed something down at the bottom as well. <laughs> and um, You can also, this is something really cool, is you can split windows in various ways, including a three-column mode, which is especially useful for ultra-wide monitors, and it worked very well. I I had fun testing that on my multi-monitor system. And the menus are actually organized kind of old school in a grid style and are icon-focused, which actually makes color-coded items easy to find and remember. And uh, one of the uh, really unique features of, of uh, the Kara desktop is you have these ki- things called rooms, and you can access the rooms icon by right-clicking on the desktop. Rooms. So with rooms, you can have different rooms based on what you do and arrange them with things for only that purpose. You can think of them like kind of like Linux workspaces, but I, only I for... I think a good way to think about the rooms is, you think of it as mm-hmm. profiles? But just for you. Yeah, true. But just for you. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, that 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 is true. It's like, uh, I, I kind of was ex- um, thinking of it as Linux workspaces, but only for certain categories of apps. Like they have a gaming gaming room, theater room, work room. So, but I like, I like your way of explaining it, Ven, with the user, like kind of like user profiles. That That's a really good way to look at it. And I actually... Did my show notes for today's LWW on my new uh, portal rig right next to me using 
the Kara desktop and its web browser. It's simply called Browser. And you can tile new tabs by clicking the plus sign in the top right of the browser menu. But because the Kara desktop, it's still in the alpha phase and not all functions and keyboard shortcuts are working yet. So I couldn't get my show notes to zoom in and out in the browser using the control plus or control minus keyboard commands, which I use all the time so I can read the text easier. <laughs> so I couldn't do that. So the text was pretty small, <laughs> but I was able to, to, to manage doing my show notes in it. <laughs> That's pretty good. And, you know, they, they were going to tell you right here on the desktop, not ready for a daily driver. You know, this, yeah. this, this isn't more playing around. There's going to be missing functionality. Mm -hmm. There's something like that. This is uh, this really seen think of it as demonstration, you know, something to play around with. What can you use it on? Linux, Windows, Mac OS, Chrome OS. Even, you know, Raspberry Pi, not a problem. I want to put it on a Chromebook, not a problem. Mm -hmm. Why? Hmm, fair question. I hear mm -hmm. you. I hear you. Like, what's the point? I've always wanted a unified desktop stack. Yeah. <laughs> something that would run on Windows, something that would run on Linux, Mac, Chrome. <laughs> I'd love to see this as like a launcher for Android, possibly, or some version of it. And yeah, the rooms idea, I like that. You think about having, you know, everything that you normally do, be able to flip your profiles around, but it stays under that primary user so you could nest those systems. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where I'm like, it's cross platform them as an electron. I'm like, not technically, but it's written in vanilla JavaScript. So yeah. it doesn't rely on any third party frameworks. It's got that going forward. It uses some independent libraries and. It looks like it's based on Linux, but the entire desktop environment runs on top of just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Oh. Mm -hmm. Are we going to say it's super performant? Probably not. But play with it. Um, desktop yeah. .karahq com. I want that. When I think about setting up guides, and we were talking about this a little bit in the pre-show, was, you know, even discrepancies between, like, even versions of Android, like, say you wanted to, you know, I was trying to think maybe there's a unified example and Android's kind of close, but you go back one version, definitely two versions of Android. Mm -hmm. Ha, there's a boom. Oh, I hear that. Thunder. I, I have upset Thor by talking about yeah. JavaScript powered desktops. <laughs> Deal with it. You missed. Um, you have to like rework tutorials and I, I would love like a unified desktop for all operating systems just to make teaching people how to computer easier. And something yes. like this is kind of interesting. And I saw about this and I posted earlier. Um, this is not the first time this has been attempted. And it's not going to be the last time. I found a project from 16 years ago that somebody had done with Firefox. And I posted that in Discord uh, earlier this week. That was kind of fascinating. So good work, everyone. Good work. I'm going to keep mm -hmm. an eye on this and see what becomes of it. Because you know what? It looks good when I... It does. You hear, uh, you know talking jill talking about and then i say it's javascript not go look at it go look at what it does how it looks how it functions a lot of thought has been like, i, I want to be like yeah, hey very innovative <laughs> innovative but logically innovative you're like hey gnome yeah. gnome do uh -huh. this yes do this <laughs> i i look i look at what they're doing with that ui i'm like that actually it's different yes but it makes sense mm -hmm. um no that's just me really good work on the design phase so yes. you might know, you might know. Um, I got a little side project, got a little side hustle. It's not really yeah. a, much of a hustle because it costs me money. But yeah. <laughs> work with me. It's the best analogy I have. <laughs> I'm in a little bit of a mission to classify and document what works and what does not work um, when it comes to audio interfaces under Linux, because that's been a big question. I start with FireWire, and of course I do PCI Express and also USB. But if it's a USB audio interface for good, this is really good. It's usually class compliant. That's why I'm not big on USB audio interfaces. You plug it in, it's normally going to work. But if they, they got some quirky stuff to it, like that task game had a built-in digital mixer, I'm like, ooh, can we get that working under Linux? Yes, we could. Mm, nice. So when I look for a USB audio interface, it's got to have something more than just an audio interface, right? It's, you want to see if we can get yeah. these extra bits working. That's where this guy comes in. PreSonus IO Station 24C, because it's not just an audio interface. No, no, no. PreSonus, they fused a fader port, which is a control surface, and a 24C audio interface into just this one production controller. And 
it's not exactly a new idea. I kind of go through this in the video and tell, you know, Tascam made one back in 2003, M Audio did one like in 2006, Behringer's got the X32 compact series, keeping the dream alive. But I didn't know, I had a legitimate question. I assume maybe the audio interface portion was just going to work out of the box because it's based on 24C. How's that going to work? Under Linux with a control surface, no idea, no documentation. You do a Google search. What do you get? You get one post from like two years ago with somebody going, maybe. Mm -hmm. So we had to find out. We had to find out. Big shout out to um, Kai Linux, Kai Jorel. Yay. Kai, Kai Jore. I'll get it <laughs> right you, in a minute. There's a link to his YouTube channel on our web zone over at linuxteamcast.com. Go check it out for additional Linux shenanigans. But. Yeah, I played around with this. Does it work with Pulse Audio? Absolutely. Does it work with Jack? No problems there. Taking a look at round trip latency. This is a, this is a benchmark, an audio interface. It's going to tell you how quick you can get audio in and out of the device. It's really important for real time monitoring. If you can do MIDI stuff, you can be playing a bass guitar or anything, anything with effects on it that you want to monitor in real time. It did pretty good with round trip latency. In fact, for USB audio interfaces, it's a second on the chart right there. I go through the test bench, everything I have set up. But the important thing was the control surface. This is how you can control digital audio workstations without using keyboard and mouse. I have two of them to do this show <laughs> because my them. keyboard and mouse, <laughs> it is a necessity. Yeah. My keyboard and mouse is occupied on this machine. Working here. I'm doing the browsers. I got to get here with this. I got to keep track of chat. Mm -hmm. I got to keep track of show notes. And I'm also switching on top of that, but that's another story. What I have to be able to do during the show is control all of the functions for the DAW live. Now, I don't know about you, but have you tried using two keyboards and mouses with one hand? Oh, yeah, that's difficult. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know a lot of people that use a keyboard and a mouse with one hand. Yeah, no. <laughs> what control surfaces allow you? They expose that functionality. For your digital workstation, it gives me faders, it gives me programmable buttons, it gives me trim nice. pods. I can tell this one on this side, like, hey, I need you to do these things. And this one's got my jog dial, jog dial transport I, yes. number. <laughs> Everything that I need set up to where I can reach over here. And most important, important I can do it by touch. So it's cool. tactile. I don't have to stop the show, take my eyes off the ball, stop being on the show. Or if I'm in the middle of talking, I can reach over here and go, oh, there's that. All right, we'll do that. So I can just mute myself like, hey, yeah, I know where all these things are going. So we wanted to find out, does it work with the two popular DAWs on door? Yes, out of the box, 100%. It is a pleasant experience on our free open source digital audio workstation. It is. Why? Because Paul's got one. <laughs> well, he's got like the big version of that. And he made sure it worked. Then we got Reaper, the big, bad, super evil, closed source, rah, rah, rah. that's the DAW I use. It's a dumpster fire in Reaper. It barely functions. In fact, when I was doing some research for this, I found out that there's an application extension for Reaper called Resonus to get oh, these control works. surfaces working with Reaper, which is always a bad sign. And, you know, of course, I point out in the video, Reaper is a dumpster fire for control surfaces. But I use it in spite of that because the goods outweigh the bads you can usually make. Anyway, um, at the end of the day, if you can find one of these like used, like 150, 170 bucks, and you're looking for like that combo device, you get a motorized fader, which is really cool. Which is really, really, um, you know, that's how I sell people. You show them the magic flying faders. You can make the fader <laughs> jump around and bounce around. And, you know, you can do all your transport controls. You can drop markers. Mutes, solos, arm all of your automation. And it works under Linux. So there we go. Now we know. We've answered the question. Yay. Does it know how to Linux? And the answer is yes. Yay. That's good to hear, Vin. <laughs> it's a good price point, too. <laughs> For new, it's missing some stuff. The, mm. Just go watch the video. I know. Bad. It's missing the jog dial, which you like. <laughs> well, it's got a jog knob. It's knob. Okay, got a knob. <laughs> it's got a knob instead of a dial. You just got to reach and touch. And it, I do compare it to a similar priced just control surface. I'm like, how does this thing just stack up against oh, a regular okay. control surface? 
And listen, it's me. I don't buy expensive control surfaces. Uh, but up against like a hundred and fifty, hundred ninety dollar control surface, like the X Touch One, it it's messing some stuff. I mean, watch the video, read the little blurb about it. You'll figure it out. I got faith in you. You're all smart people. But <laughs> what do we got next? All right, that's right. If you would like to support the show and things like that, where we buy things and find out if they know how to Linux, you can help doing that. Patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. We also have wish list where Jill has yeah. penguin cups and <laughs> keyboards. I have <laughs> cameras and stuffing for <laughs> insulation <laughs> for the studio. I got some audio faces down here at the bottom too. Yeah, you do. And we also have a store, store.linuxgamecast.com. We do appreciate your support. Anything you can kick in, share the show, tell Tell your friends, tell a cat, whatever you got going on around you. Or just show up live. Come say hello. Leave a comment or a question below the video, wherever you may be. Even on Odyssey. Every now and then, I remember that we have a Odyssey channel, and I'll go check the comments. And I'll reply to them. Yeah. I do stuff like that. <laughs> if you're a patron, you get access. Oh, if you're a Twitch sub or a patron. Um, oh, thanks for the resub, Nubbin. Thanks, Don M, for the resub. Access yeah. to our Discord. If you're a patron, you get the live and uncut versions of these shows. A bunch of extra things. All of our patrons get to see anything I was working on. I released that video a couple of days ago in preview mode. Like, here, take a look at it. Get any th- feedback. And I got some feedback in Discord. Good times. Had. Bye. All. Do you have anything you uh, want to plug, Jill? Oh, well, uh, make sure to go check out our merch store as well, where, where you can get yourself some Frank t shirts. <laughs> and some Muse Penguin t-shirts. That's right. Forever21.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Forever21.com. <laughs> go to our go to our linuxgamecast.com and check out the merch section. <laughs> okay. We are running long, but we still got one last bit to get to. You remember uh-huh. this guy. Yeah, the cute little Ibo, Ibo. companion robot. <laughs> Ibo's still around. Ibo is still eye-wateringly expensive. Yeah. Dude, uh, $2,800. Yeah. But it's 2023, everyone. So not only can you do that, you can get the Ibo AI cloud plan renewal for 12 months at $300. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. What do we have affordable? Uh, you can get two paw pads for ten dollars. Uh, you can get an eye bone <laughs> and a food bowl for twenty dollars. Twenty dollars for food bowl. The dice. This is this is absolutely <laughs> too expensive, Jill. Do you get a solution? Yeah. Yes, I do. So, do you want to create a mini version of the Boston Dynamics robot dog spot, or your own version of Ibo? Well, then this orange Raspberry Pi quadruped named dingo is a great solution at a fraction of the cost so engineering students alexander calvert and nathan ferguson of manosh engineering have created an impressive quadruped robot that relies on the raspberry pi 4b and according to the students the intention was to create a low-cost solution that would be ideal for research and modifiable with additional components. And while using a remote control, you can actually operate its pitch, roll, yaw, and adjust for speed, just just like its uh, Boston Dynamics uh, brethren. And I thought, this is something that's really cool, is I thought it was cool that the students actually used a PlayStation 4 controller for their remote control. (laughs) Way to go. And the, the, this, this little uh, dingo quadruped can crouch and carry a bit of weight to transport things as well. And what's cool is the body is 3D printable, and there are lots of parts required. There's an, an Arduino Nano and a huge list of hardware, which includes 12 oh, servos. Oh, they come on. All right. I, I, want, to, I want to throttle <laughs> somebody over doing this video because there's like <laughs> two seconds of interesting what I'm here to watch the video about the object followed by (laughs) 30 seconds of face cam talking. Yeah. (laughs) Well, in the middle of the videos where all the movement is by the doggy. (laughs) 
<laughs> Give me a timestamp. I dare you to show me the timestamp. I just been through this entire like, video. I think five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. I think. <laughs> I watched it yesterday. <laughs> Everything we get like four or five seconds, and they're like, Poof. "Here, back to face cam." Back Poof, to face back cam. To face. I'm like, I'm not here to watch you talk into the cam. I want to see the Robo Puppers dance around and buy I Robo know. Puppers. What do I mean? I want to build a hunter killer robot. Yes, you do, Vin. <laughs> and you can you actually find the complete parts list on the project's GitHub page, as well as the you know the operating system it, it uses is Ubuntu, and the coding tools you will need are VS Code and the robot operating system Noetic as well as custom Python scripts to handle things like controller input. But so yeah, go check out the GitHub page for all that goodness to build your own. And you don't have to pay, pay a monthly subscription fee <laughs> like you do with the other puppy <laughs> robot. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, Ven, you were, you were looking at the, the cost. Yeah, I went ahead and broke that down. Your your bill of materials on this is going to be more than you would think, but it's significantly less than an IBO. It's about yeah. thirteen hundred bucks US. Yeah, great. <laughs> now, if you were like, "Oh yeah, that'd be great to build for like fifty bucks," I'm like this is not what you're going to be looking for. Let's see if we can get it running Windows XP though. Ah, <laughs> that way that, that will greatly increase the chance of it going absolutely berserk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is true. <laughs> or you could put <laughs> Windows Millennium on it. <laughs> That's right. It, it'll yeah. just freeze up and fall over. Like, what's wrong with yeah. your dag? It's, it's not yes. a dag, it's dingo. It ain't my baby. <laughs> oh. Well, it, it's cool because it does run Linux, of course. <laughs> so. It runs in Ubuntu. I don't know how I feel about yeah. that. Um, <laughs> well, it's based on the um, Stanford Pupper, which... Yeah. Is infinitely more durable because it's got googly eyes. <laughs> yeah. We talked about that one a while ago, too. Oh, probably. Yeah, about yeah. three years ago. Mm -hmm. Five years ago. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. That's going to do it for this show. Run it a little bit long. Had a good time. I think we got everything covered. <laughs> Moral of the story, uh, just run out there and buy some uh, Sony Ibos. Ebos. Buy an yeah. original one. Do that. <laughs> No, buy a buy a a Boston Dynamic uh, spot <laughs> and be in debt for the rest of your life. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, we'll look up in the after show. Stick around if you're watching live. We'll find out how much we can get one of those on the used market. But until then, yeah. let's roll some credits. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aw, thank you to all our awesome patrons. Thanks again, Nubbin and Donim, for the resub. And we have so many awesome people to thank, including our. Advisors, Omegas and Artharin. <laughs> and we have awesome executive producers, Barbara, Ant, Scott M, Mike G, Chicago People, Empty, Blasphemy, Super Dust Stout, Sea Monsters, Darkwing, System T, Mark, DSN Joe, <laughs> Cairo, Linux, <laughs> Death Notes, lots of them. I can't name them all. And Chairlings. <laughs> Our credits are so fast, I can't name them all. But all you lovely people, you know who you are. Thank you for watching and contributing. Uh, next week, I want you to watch Blindfolded with earplugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting, Ben. <laughs> you know what? Don't even watch the show, but hop in chat and pretend you are. Just ask yeah. inane random questions and see if we yeah. can tell. All right, everyone. <laughs> see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>